So uh, today we're going to be talking about panpsychism. Okay. Um, and I have to say, this is one of the weirder ideas in philosophy that we've ever covered. Well, it's certainly a mind-bending concept. That it is. Uh, th so, so what is panpsychism? So panpsychism is the view that consciousness is fundamental and ubiquitous. Okay. So everything has some form of consciousness. Everything like my water bottle. Yeah, your water bottle, the table, the trees, the rocks, even the atoms that make up those things. So you're saying that everything in the universe has some kind of mind or awareness? Yes, in some form, yeah. I mean, I could see how humans and animals have consciousness even though we don't fully understand it. Right. But how can something like a rock or a water bottle be conscious? Yeah, that's, that's where it gets tricky and that's why a lot of people find panpsychism hard to swallow. Yeah. But the kind of consciousness that panpsychists are talking about isn't necessarily the same as the kind of consciousness that we have as humans. Okay. It's not about rocks having thoughts or feelings in the way that we do. It's more about a very basic kind of perhaps experience, a very rudimentary kind of awareness. So, so like a very primitive form of consciousness. Yeah, you could think of it that way. Okay, so so where did this idea even come from? Is this like a new age thing? No, actually, panpsychism has been around for a long time. You can trace it back to some of the ancient Greek philosophers. Oh, really? Like who? Well, like Thales, for example. He's considered the father of Western philosophy, and he believed that everything was full of gods. Full of gods? Yeah, that was his way of saying that there was some kind of mind or soul or animating principle in everything in nature. I see, so it's not exactly the same as modern panpsychism. Right, it's not exactly the same. But it has a similar kind of vibe. Yeah, it's a similar idea that there's something more to the universe than just matter and motion. Were there any other early thinkers who explored this kind of idea? Yeah, another really influential figure is Plato. Oh, Plato. He developed the idea of the world soul, or anima mundi. Yeah, it's a beautiful term that basically means the soul of the world, and he believed that this world soul was a single unified consciousness that permeated the entire cosmos. So like a giant cosmic mind that everything is connected to? Exactly. That's pretty wild. It is a wild idea. So how do we get from ancient Greece to modern panpsychism? Well, panpsychism has kind of gone in and out of fashion over the centuries, but it's had a bit of a resurgence in recent decades. Why is that? Well, I think there are a few reasons. One is that there's a growing dissatisfaction with the materialistic worldview. Materialistic worldview. Yeah, the idea that everything can be explained in terms of matter and physical laws. Oh, okay. And this dissatisfaction comes from a number of places, like the hard problem of consciousness, for example. The hard problem of consciousness. Yeah, this is the problem of explaining how subjective experience arises from physical matter. Right, like how does a bunch of neurons firing in my brain create the feeling of seeing the color red. Exactly, and science has made a lot of progress in understanding the brain and how it works, but it still hasn't been able to explain how those physical processes give rise to subjective experience, to qualia, to the feeling of what it's like to be. So panpsychism offers a different perspective on this problem. Yeah, instead of trying to explain how consciousness emerges from matter, Panpsychism says that consciousness is fundamental and doesn't need to emerge from anything. So it's like saying that consciousness is an ingredient in the universe, not a product. Exactly. It's always been there. It's built into the fabric of reality. Hmm. I'm not sure I buy it, but I'm willing to hear you out. Okay. Okay. So if consciousness is fundamental, are there different types of consciousness? Well, yeah. There are many different versions of panpsychism, and they have different ways of understanding how consciousness is fundamental and how it manifests in the world. Like, what are some examples? Well, one example is cosmopsychism. Cosmopsychism. Yeah, this is the view that there is a single universal consciousness, kind of like Plato's world soul, and that individual consciousnesses like ours are just fragments or expressions of this larger cosmic mind. So we're all like little pieces of a giant cosmic mind. Yeah, that's the basic idea. Whoa, that's trippy. It is a trippy idea. What are some other types of panpsychism? Um, another one is panexperientialism. Panexperientialism. Yes, and this view emphasizes experience as the most fundamental aspect of reality. Okay. So instead of focusing on thought, it focuses on feeling or sensing. So even simple entities like atoms have experiences. Well, in a very rudimentary form, yeah, it wouldn't be the same kind of experience that we have. Right. But it would be some kind of basic proto-consciousness. Proto-consciousness. Yeah, like the building blocks of consciousness. Okay, I'm starting to see how this all fits together, but it still feels like a big leap to go from atoms having experiences to humans having consciousness. 
It is a big leap, and there are a lot of details to fill in, but that's the basic framework. Okay. And there are other versions of panpsychism as well, like panprotopsychism and Rossilian monism. Those are some big words. Yeah, they are, but we can get into those later if you're interested. Right. But for now, I think the main point is that panpsychism is a broad family of views that all share the core idea that consciousness is fundamental and ubiquitous. Right, so we've talked about what panpsychism is and where it came from, but why should we take it seriously? That's a good question. Is there any actual evidence for it, or is it just a bunch of philosophical speculation? Well, that's a debate that's still ongoing, but there are some arguments in favor of panpsychism and some arguments against it. I think one of the main reasons why people are drawn to panpsychism is that it offers a different way of looking at the world. Different how? Well, it challenges the kind of Cartesian dualism that's been dominant in Western thought for centuries. Cartesian dualism, you mean like the idea that mind and body are separate substances? Exactly. And this separation has led to a lot of problems, both philosophical and practical. Like what? Well, for one thing, it makes it really hard to explain how the mind and body interact if they're fundamentally different things. Right, like how does my mind control my body or how does my body affect my mind? Exactly, and it also creates a kind of hierarchy where the mind is seen as superior to the body and this has had all sorts of negative consequences for how we treat our bodies and how we treat the natural world. Okay, I see your point. So panpsychism offers a way out of this dualistic trap. Yeah, by saying that consciousness is fundamental and ubiquitous, it dissolves the separation between mind and matter. So instead of having two separate realms, the mental and the physical, we have one unified reality where everything has both mental and physical properties. Exactly. And this has some pretty profound implications for how we understand ourselves and our place in the universe. Like what kind of implications? Well, for one thing, it means that we're not just isolated egos trapped inside our own heads. Okay. We're actually part of a larger web of consciousness that connects us to everything else in the universe. Wow, that's a pretty big shift in perspective. It is. And it could have some pretty big implications for how we live our lives. Yeah, it could change how we relate to other people, to other animals, to the planet, and even to the cosmos as a whole. So panpsychism is not just a philosophical theory. It's a way of life. Yeah, you could say that it's a way of seeing the world that emphasizes interconnectedness and interdependence. Okay, so we've talked about some of the philosophical arguments for panpsychism. Are there any scientific arguments? Well, that's a more controversial area, but there are some scientists who are starting to explore the possibility that panpsychism might be compatible with modern physics. Oh, really? Like how? Well, one area of interest is quantum mechanics, which has shown that the observer plays a crucial role in how reality behaves. The observer, you mean like how the act of observing a quantum system can affect its state? Exactly. And this has led some physicists to speculate that consciousness might be a fundamental aspect of reality at the quantum level. So our minds could be affecting the fabric of reality. Well, it's a possibility, and it's something that some panpsychists have pointed to as evidence for their view. Hmm. That's pretty far out. It is far out, but it's also very intriguing, and it's something that more and more scientists are starting to take seriously. So it seems like there's a growing convergence between philosophy and science on this issue. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's one of the things that makes panpsychism such an exciting area of inquiry right now. Okay, so we've talked about the philosophical and scientific arguments for panpsychism. What about the arguments against it? Well, as you can imagine, there are plenty of those too. Like what? Well, one of the most common objections is that panpsychism is just too weird. Too weird. Yeah, people say it's counterintuitive, it's implausible, it's just too hard to believe that everything has consciousness. I can see how people would say that. I mean, it does go against our everyday experience. It does, but panpsychists would argue that our everyday experience is limited and that we need to be open to the possibility that reality is much stranger than we think. Okay, fair enough. What are some other objections? Um, another common objection is that panpsychism is untestable. Untestable? Yeah, critics say that there's no way to scientifically prove or disprove the claim that everything has consciousness. Right, like how do you measure the consciousness of a rock? Exactly, and this lack of empirical evidence makes panpsychism more of a, fil a philosophical speculation than a scientific theory. Okay, so it's more of a metaphysical idea than a scientific but, one. Yeah, you could say that, but panpsychists would argue that metaphysics is still an important part of our understanding of the world, and that we shouldn't dismiss ideas just because we can't test them in a lab. I guess that's true. Yeah. What are some other objections? Um, another one is that panpsychism doesn't really solve the hard problem of consciousness. It doesn't. Well, critics say that even if we grant that everything has consciousness, 
it still doesn't explain how that consciousness arises from physical matter. Right, like how do all those little bits of consciousness in atoms and molecules combine to create the complex consciousness that we have as humans? Exactly. That's what's known as the combination problem. The combination problem. Yeah, and it's a problem that panpsychists haven't really been able to solve yet. Hmm. So it seems like panpsychism raises more questions than it answers. Well, in a way that's true, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes the best theories are the ones that make us ask new and deeper questions. I guess that's true. So where does that leave us? Well, I think it leaves us with a lot to think about. That's for sure. Panpsychism is a radical idea, but it's also a very powerful one, and it has the potential to change the way we see ourselves and the world around us. I think you're right. It's definitely made me question some of my assumptions about consciousness and reality. And that's a good thing. I think we need to be constantly challenging our assumptions and expanding our horizons. I agree. So what are some of the implications of panpsychism? If it's true, how would it change our lives? Well, I think it would have a profound impact on almost every aspect of our lives. Like how? Well, for one thing, it would change how we treat the natural world. Okay. If we believe that everything has consciousness, then we would have to start treating all living beings with respect and reverence. Right. We couldn't just exploit them for our own selfish purposes. Exactly. And it would also change how we see ourselves. Well, if we're not just isolated egos, but part of a larger web of consciousness, then that means that we're all interconnected and interdependent. And that has implications for how we treat each other. Exactly. It means that we need to start seeing each other as partners, not competitors. And it means that we need to start working together to create a more just and sustainable world. So panpsychism is not just about understanding the universe. It's about changing the world. Yeah, I think that's true at its core. Panpsychism is a call to action. It's a call to live more consciously and compassionately. And it's a call to create a world where all beings can flourish. That's a beautiful vision. It is, and it's a vision that I think is worth striving for. I agree. So what do you think? Are you convinced? I'm not sure I'm fully convinced, but I'm definitely intrigued, and I'm going to keep thinking about it. That's all I ask. Okay, well, thanks for opening my mind to this fascinating idea. It's been my pleasure. So what? where do we go from here? Well, I think the best thing to do is to just keep exploring these ideas and see where they lead us. There's a lot of great work being done on panpsychism right now, both in philosophy and in science, and I'm excited to see what new insights emerge in the years to come. Me too. Well, thanks again for this amazing conversation. You're welcome. And thanks to all of you for listening. Bye. Bye. It's been a really stimulating conversation. Yeah, no kidding. My brain is definitely full. Good. I like to leave people with something to chew on. Well, you've definitely succeeded at that. Uh, yeah. You know, one thing that I keep coming back to is just how radically different this panpsychist view of the world is from how most of us normally think. It is a pretty big shift in perspective, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's not just about trying to understand consciousness. It's about fundamentally rethinking our relationship with reality. That's right. It's about seeing the world as a place where consciousness is not some rare or special phenomenon, but a fundamental aspect of everything. Even things that seem totally inert, like rocks and chairs. Even those things, yeah. I mean, that's just so hard to wrap my head around. I know it takes some getting used to, but yeah. once you start to see the world through this lens, it can really change how you experience everything. I can imagine. So what are some of the practical implications of this view? I mean, if we really start to take panpsychism seriously, how would it change our lives? Well, I think one of the biggest implications would be for how we treat the environment. Okay. If we believe that everything has some level of consciousness, then we can't just treat the natural world as a resource to be exploited. Right. We would have to start treating all living beings with respect and even perhaps reconsider our relationship with things that we normally think of as inanimate. Exactly. It would require a whole new level of ethical awareness and responsibility. And it's not just about the environment, right? No, it would also change how we interact with each other. Okay. If we see ourselves as part of a larger web of consciousness, then we would have to start treating each other with more compassion and understanding. Because we're all interconnected. Exactly. We're all part of the same cosmic dance. So panpsychism is not just a heady philosophical idea. It has real world implications. It definitely does. It's a philosophy that could change the world. Well, I'm not sure if I'm ready to fully embrace panpsychism just yet. But I have to say, it's given me a lot to think about. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. Thanks for sharing your insights with me. It's been a truly mind-bending conversation. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And all of you listening out there, thanks for joining us on this deep dive into panpsychism. Until next time. Bye.